I would like to introduce you to two very brave men. They are producer David Putnam and director Roland Jaffe. They have just made The Killing Fields. I say brave men, gentlemen, because you seem to have that wonderful idea that movies can not only be entertaining, but can be substantial. And David Putnam first, from Ken Russell and Mahler, to Ridley Scott and the Duelists, to local hero Chariots of Fire and now Killing Fields. How do you get away with this idea <laughs> that movies can be about something? Um, I'm encouraging that belief by, uh, by Warner Brothers, who uh, have allowed me, to, uh, allowed me to get away with that belief. But has there been obstacles? People who want froth and entertainment only? Yes, but I think that what's marvelous about the film industry is it's capable of that mix. And uh, I think what I'm being allowed to get away with, courtesy of uh, Steven Spielberg and Clint Eastwood and all the other people who are making it possible, is I, the films I've been allowed to produce are part of the mix. And the mix requires the movies that we make as much as it requires the movies that uh, th those other people make. And a sensibility to young talent around you. In that wise, would you introduce us to Roland Joffe? Yes, I, I couldn't be more proud to do so. <laughs> Where did you learn of him? And uh, uh, how long have you worked together now? Well, we've been working together consistent. We've, we've been in each other's pockets, I think, almost four years, and we're about to st start on another venture together, so we're... we're another pocket. Another pocket. Um, I saw work that Roland had done on television, which I felt was extraordinary, quite extraordinary, and I felt that by the nature in which he used the frame on television, his, his films for television were exploding out of the frame. So it seemed to me that here was a director whose natural metier was actually cinema, not television. Uh -huh. From an interest to Jacobean drama, to Cambodian history, Tell me about the tie that binds there. Is there a connection that you can see? Yes, there is, and I think the connection probably is to do with your, the first question that you put to David, um, which is that, that uh, as a child, I think I, I was brought up with a large group of people in a largish family, and they all held differing opinions. And I used to sit there at the bottom of the table while all these opinions were aired. I don't think they ever actually shared an opinion at all. They just consistently swapped them. And as a child, I remember thinking, but how can they all be right? Because they all would come up and say, I know that Auntie Thurns so said that, but actually she's wrong. And then Auntie Thurns would come up to me and say, look, I know Uncle Jack said that, but actually he's wrong. But I think as a child, very early on, I thought there must be some sense to well, this. Remember Octave in Rules of the Game, he says, the thing about this world is that everybody has their reasons for what they do. That's right. They do indeed. Absolutely they do. Those people who may be worried about Cambodian history, they don't know Cambodian history, it may intimidate them and keep them from coming to the theater. Would each of you direct your statement about that right to the camera? Yes, uh, two things I would say, worth, well worth saying. One is that we had a longer version of the film that was more explicit about Cambodian history and dealt more in the why and the wherefore uh, than, the, than, than, than the, the, the film, the finished film, which was, I think, is, I think, a much more elliptical version. That was rejected by audiences. When we tested the film, um, they couldn't, they loved the movie, but they were, it was that old cliche about don't confuse me with the facts. We laid in too many facts. <laughs> and the film quite clearly came to work as an emotional piece. And we were able to get away with, an, say, an elliptical picture, which uh, probably on, on, on the page wouldn't have worked. Uh, it leads me to believe that audiences are much, much smarter than distributors and finances and producers and directors take them for. Let's talk audiences. Future of the Killing Fields, you told me before we started, if a Kansas City audience will go for it, its success is assured. Would you explain that? That's the feeling uh, and the received knowledge within the film community, that Kansas City is a, is a, is a laboratory, a microcosm of, of America. And if the audience is in Kansas, respond to the film well, and not so much on whether they're driven in by the advertising, but on the word of mouth basis, if they recommend it to each other and turn up and see it, the second week always becomes terribly important, then the film will work. Plus we have another ace up our sleeve, which is that 88% of the women who've seen the film currently, and we don't forget we're opening in five or six cities already, think it's the best film they've ever seen. So if we can get women to screw up their courage, come and see it, and deliver that verdict, we're a hit. Music in this picture, Roland Jaffe, how closely did you and David work? with Mr. Oldfield, an extraordinary score on all counts, I think. Very closely, actually. I mean, uh, because we, re we redid things and we chatted about things and we played things backwards and forwards. Mike worked extremely hard. I mean, it was the first time Mike had, had, had done this and it was a similar position to myself. It was my first feature film. Mike took the film away and he played it to himself constantly and he sat with it for hours in his studio. And he, he tried to do what we tried to do in a way, I think, is that he, he wanted to bear in mind the human and I'd said to him when we talked about it, I said, you know, every time a machine arrives, this metal and iron thing that is after all made by human hands, uh, its consequence usually is to push out of the way the human beings, the people that finally were interested in it and that we love. And I think you should try and find that in your music. And that was the, the line that Mike took. 
and, and tried to express that musically, and I think did it wonderfully well. There's precedence for these contrasts, too. Bresson uses Mozart in images of confinement. We have Puccini <laughs> here in the fields of Cambodia. Uh, is there an aesthetic working here, maybe, with the two of you, or is that strictly old field? No, no, that's, well, it's also Bruce Robinson who wrote the script, and he, he envisaged that scene. It's, it, it's perfect in, it, in so many ways, because that music is expressing a man's yearning. Uh, a man's yearning to be reunited with somebody uh, at a time when there is death and destruction. It's also it's also um, a Westerner's view of the Orient and uh, with the Puccini music, and therefore that fusion with the images and a man who is now dislocated from from Cambodia and yet cares desperately about a man who is there, cares about his friend, wants to to make some kind of contact, mm -hmm. and yet doesn't know where his friend is or whether his friend is available ever again, was just an extraordinarily powerful fusion. And what a contact upon us, about 30 seconds left, I guess, but the contrast, so much vivid beauty and violence coexisting. David Putnam. Uh, yes, I mean, I think but that's the richness that was inherent in the story. Here we had a love story, a love story of a relationship between two, uh, between two men that was non-sexual, but unbelievably close, uh, as you say, in, against a background which is about as complex and as devastating as has ever been put on film. You sure have a fine cameraman. A terrific cameraman, yes. From local hero to this, two totally different kinds of atmosphere created on screen. He's a very extraordinary man, Christopher, and he has first-hand knowledge of exactly these circumstances. Like I say, bravery here. David Putnam, Roland Jaffe, The Killing Fields, and they are looking for you in Kansas City as their audience. And from New York City for KCTV 5, this is John Tibbetts.